Greetings all. It's good to be back. I have uh, some admissions to make first. When I said yes, I looked at my schedule and I thought, Louis, are you completely crazy? You really should say no. But I hate saying no to y'all, so I said yes anyway. I'm gonna give you a snapshot of what my life looks like in this moment. This month, you know, those of you that know me know that I'm always busy. This month would be perfectly reasonable for someone who is truly energetic and 25. I'm not either of those. So I, uh, I got back uh, from Philadelphia um, around midnight last night and finally got to sleep at about 2 o'clock in the morning. Got up for service, had an engagement after service and before here. And then I'll get home. Tomorrow I'll do my homework for this week's class. Um, Tuesday I'm back at work. Wednesday I'm leading a New Testament, the third of a New Testament group at my church. Thursday night I have class. Friday I have a chance to kind of catch up and breathe. Saturday is preparation for the drag service. Sunday is the drag service. And then I fly out at 5 o'clock Monday morning to Dallas for a conference. Pray for me. I say all that uh, not only to explain that I'm a little frazzled and a little tired and less, I have less snap, snap, crackle, and pop than I normally do, but I say that to say that sometimes when you ask God to give you purpose, God gives you lots of purpose. And trust that things will come together to allow you to show up for that. <coughs> How many of you grew up on a farm? Anybody? One? Did you have sheep on your farm? The hills were alive with the sound of, bah, of, of sheep. What did you learn about sheep when you were witnessing them across on the hills over there? Mm. Yes. When I was a, a boy living on my grandparents, staying with my grandparents, I noticed the sheep followed one another. Yeah. We use the term sheep a lot, kind of in reference to our biblical relationship with Christ. But I don't know that a city slicker like myself actually thinks about what that means. Um, and so the notion of how to be sheep vexed me a great deal. When I was thinking about it, I thought, I don't think I know how to be sheep. So this whole Lord is my shepherd thing, what does that really mean? You know, sheep, um, the relationship between the sheep and the shepherd is a lot like the relationship between my daughter and I. My daughter has a will and a personality of her very own, and part of my job is to corral her from time to time and keep her safe from the dogs and the wolves and the road and whatever else might be out there. When we are doing those things with God, we are that willful child that God is trying to corral. Now, in a world that is all about self-sufficiency and agency and autonomy and I'll do it my way, sometimes the shepherd needs to use the rod and the staff. That's hard for us to accept. In the reading in John, Jesus talks about the ways in which the sheep hear Jesus' voice. I will want to admit to you and have you interrogate for yourselves, um, the sheep may hear Jesus' voice. I may hear Jesus' voice, but I'm still a sheep. And I may just go some other direction until Jesus gets a little loud and employs other things. Where are you going with this, Lewis? Well, I want to encourage you that if in fact we want to be sheep, we have to learn a little bit of humility and a little bit of willingness to be led. Sometimes that willingness to be led means that we're being led someplace that we didn't really want to go. Those of us who are in religious studies may have tried everything we could to find another path another job, one that perhaps pays well, that has less uh, challenging studies, one that our parents and grandparents would pat us on the back instead of saying, that's lovely, but you're still going to hell in a handbasket, according to my theology. Um, you know, but we have those moments 
where the shepherd is telling us to go somewhere and will not let us change course, no matter how much we try. There are others who are perhaps are not called to ministry in, an, in a kind of ordained way, but are called to a particular type of service that they may rail against. And yet, the shepherd is leading them in that way. How to be sheep? It means sometimes that we'll be corrected and chastised. It also means sometimes we will be shorn, that things will be stripped from us so that we can fulfill our purpose in that moment. That is never a comfortable thing, I imagine, for the sheep waiting to be shorn. Afterwards, they may feel fancy and cooler and more relaxed and less fleecy, but in the moment, it's a terrifying experience. Any of you ever have that experience where something is taken away from you and you, you don't really know why and you don't really like it? After the fact, you realize, hey, that was a good thing. But in the moment, you feel like, what is this about? It's about learning to be sheep, is what it's about. I want to also ask you to do something with me as we head into this year. This is a particularly awesome time of year. It's that middle time, that springtime, between resurrection and Pentecost, when we've been given a reason to believe in a new life, but we're still in that place of full hubris where we think we know some stuff. We think we know, I mean, the disciples really thought that they had a handle on this thing until Pentecost came along and shook them up and broke open everything they thought they knew. We are much like that. We're in that place where we're, we're, we're wondering if the seeds that we've planted are going to grow what we think they're gonna grow. And what I'll tell you is that sometimes the seeds we plant grow something completely different than what we thought we were planting. Sometimes magic and miracles and mercy and grace and the Holy Spirit come in and they turn our ear of corn into a head of lettuce. You know, really impossible things that happen. I wanna share with you a story that happened to me recently. So last Thursday and Friday, I was in Bilrica. Am I saying that right? Okay, I mispronounced that a lot and was corrected heavily because, of course, like many towns in Massachusetts, it doesn't look like that. I love that. Um, so I'm in Bill Ricca and I'm at this Boundary Awareness Training for the United Church of Christ, which is a mandatory thing that I have to do. And it's lunchtime, and during our introductions, I had said something about being from L.A., so one of the guys there said, oh my gosh, I'm from LA too. And I said, where in LA? And he said, well, it's a little small town. You've probably never heard of it. And I said, well, I'm from West Covina, Edgewood, class of 78. And he said, oh my God, I'm Edgewood, class of 77. I'm like, whoa. So we actually went to high school like together, like at the same time. And the next day he brought in a yearbook, fortunately from his year, so I wasn't in it. <laughs> that was really good. But it was one of those moments where he said to me, yeah, I can see that you transitioned, but ministry, I never would have seen that coming. And I said, that makes two of us. I didn't see it coming either. And I would, if, if somebody had said, uh, I want you to bet that you're gonna end up like this, I, I'll take that bet. There's no way that that's where I'm gonna end up. But we both ended up in this place of ministry and he was um, very, he had started out his ministry very kind of uh, conservative evangelical. That's where he started. And his life took him on a series of twists and turns that led him to a more compassionate and progressive place in his understanding of God, his understanding of the Bible, his understanding of his ministry. My life started out um, in a place of uh, denial and addiction and pain and running as quickly as I could from life. There was nothing about adulthood that looked compelling to me. I just wanted out. And through a series of twists and turns, we ended up in the same place together. Somehow, I don't know if he got the carrot and I got the stick or vice versa, but the shepherd led us to this place where we could come together and realize that even though we didn't know we were on a journey together, that we, the shepherd was leading us to this place. Why do I mention that story to you? Because you have no idea where God is leading you. Sometimes you think you know yourself so incredibly well that you know your gifts, 
your talents, your habits, your idiosyncrasies, perhaps your compulsions, your limitations. My shepherd hears my voice. My, my sheep hear my voice. I know them. I know them. I know them. And they follow me. In spite of what we may learn in Mississippi and North Carolina and uh, in Massachusetts, since they have yet to pass a public accommodations bill to protect people like me, um, no one will ever snatch me away from my shepherd. No one. That is guaranteed to me in this passage. That also would indicate in some ways that I myself also can't snatch myself away from this shepherd. Sometimes I'm the no one. The thing that is most on my heart, and I'm going to wrap up with this, in this time of blooming, in this time of, of, of growing what we've planted and the seeds that we think we have sown, anything is possible. God's got us, and you never know where you're going to end up. But you will end up exactly where God needs you to be planted. It may be that we end up going to the hospital because the person in the bed next to us needs our witness or the nurse attending to us needs our witness. It may mean that we go back to a school where people tend to be very right of center because they need our witness. Or we're called back to a family emergency because someone in the family needs our witness. It may be that there's someone whose child is still trying to find acceptance from their parents. And we get to be the voice of reason only with them, even if nothing changes with their parents. God has purpose for us and we never get to know what that purpose is. Believe, believe that the shepherd's got you, and all will be well as designed and purposed by God. Amen.